Good morning and welcome back to the 120th. Today we're talking about the Mamiya 645, an absolute classic of the 120 film medium format uh, cameras. Shooting 6x45 as the name would suggest, uh, this has been around for many years and has gone through many different iterations and in fact was still being made in some versions, uh, albeit under uh, different names, until very, very recently. As the name would suggest, the frames are six by four five, so six centimeters by four and a half centimeters. So for people moving from 35 mil uh, to medium format, it's possibly a slightly easier transition because they're that kind of rectangular frames rather than the six by six, which people do often say that they struggle with. They struggle with composition on a square frame. Um, so the 645 is obviously very popular. If you're moving to from 35 mil to medium format, specifically for bigger negatives and more resolution, then obviously uh, six by four five is not as big and, and not as much uh, negative real estate as the six by six frames. And of course, six by four five is exactly half the size of a six by nine. So they are kind of smaller frames. Uh, and therefore, you know, if you're looking for the ultimate resolution, uh, then 645 might not be for you. However, it is a big step up from 35mm, it is a much bigger negative. The first Mamiya 645 was brought out in 1975. Uh, all Mamiya 645s uh, require a battery. So even the very first ones brought out in 1975 had an electronically controlled shutter. And so without a battery uh, will not work, nothing will happen. So the first version of the Mamiya 645 came out in 1975. Then a year later, there was brought out the Mamiya 645 1000S, which had the addition of a 1 1000th shutter speed. Then in 1979, they brought out this one, the 645J, which was a bit of a stripped down version of the previous two. Uh, lost a few features, um, a bit of a budget version, if you like. After this one, after the 645J, there came the second generation of Mamiya 645s. Starting in 1985 with the Mamiya 645 Super, the 645 Pro in 1993, Pro TL in 1997, and then the 645E in 2000. Then in 1999, Mamiya started the 645 AFs, which are, as you would expect, autofocus versions. Back to this one though, 645J. I have obviously on it a uh, metered through the lens prism finder. So this prism finder has a coupled exposure meter. It's not auto exposure because it has no means of controlling the camera's exposure. However, it is coupled, it is linked. And the way it does it uh, is with this rather clever, clever system here, which is very similar to what you would find on a Nikon F2. If you've ever seen a Nikon F2 and the, the bunny ears uh, lenses. If you look just here, there's a little notch and that can be moved left and right. And on the lens, uh, there's a corresponding little tab across the top, which moves when you change the aperture. And what that does is it tells the camera, it converts your uh, physical aperture setting into an electronic signal, which tells the camera what your aperture is. You are then gonna also set the ISO of the film here, so it knows what the sensitivity of the film is, and then it's got two of the three things. So it's got the sensitivity of the film, it's got the aperture setting, it can then give you a shutter speed uh, to create the correct exposure for the light that it is seeing. On this one, I have a Mamiya Seacore C 80mm f2.8, which is pretty standard, pretty bog standard um, for what came with the camera. On the 645J, unlike many of its contemporaries, there is no interchangeable back. Push the, push the tab across, and there we go. You're open, and then there's a little insert that comes out that you use to load your film. And you put that back in, close the back, and then you'd wind on, and then you're good to go. It's a nice, neat little camera, as is often the case with the 645s. They tend to be smaller in the body uh, than uh, some of the 6x6s, or definitely the 6x9s. Uh, very portable, still quite heavy, probably a good kilo and a half, two kilos, especially with the prism finder on the top, um, but neat enough. So if you saw my video of probably a month ago or so, you would have seen me going out for a day out with my youngest daughter. 
Uh, my eldest daughter got very jealous, and so tomorrow I'm going to take my eldest daughter out for a day out, and uh, she can also be part of a YouTube video. That's the plan. Looking forward to it. I'll see you out there. Right then, we're out walking with little one and the dog flying around as always. So what's on the, what are we doing today, Cora? What's on the cards? We're going to feed Norwood. And we're going to go to Waggers for lunch after this. Here we are. We've got a roll of Pro 400H loaded. My precious, my precious Pro 400H. So let's just take one here. Oh my God, I forgot my camera. Oh, did you? Where is it? In the car. Let us begin. That's on the first frame. Right, here we go. Smile, lovely. Might try and get a photo of you with a big view behind you. How do you feel about that? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Ooh. Dizzy told. Oh, look at that. There we go. Let's try this. A little bit high, so let's close that down to F11. And that says it's bang on the money. So nice and still for a second, please. And I'm very close on you now, so. Let's get a much wider one. There we go, that's lovely. Super. So you got your paper, you got your crayons. So how does it work, how do you do it? Oh, brilliant. That's amazing. Right, you carry on. I'm just going to get a photo of you doing that. All right. Right, let's do another one. I'm going to try it on one on its side. One, here we go, ready? Stick your head out. Eee, perfect. And that's a film done. I've just taken 16 photos of you, Cora. I know that was that went really quick, didn't it? Time flies when you're having fun. Right, let's change the roll. Let's go with a, a gold 200. Right, we're nearly there. Ah, oh, oh no! Oh dear. Well, that's how to destroy a film. Can you hold that for me? I need to get another one out. Thank you. That one. I'll put that one over here, cover it up a bit. Okay, good to go? All right, wait there, Cora. I'm gonna have a photo of you in the middle of that tree. And hang on, nearly there. Good, three, two, one. Yay! Do one more. I'm gonna get super close up, so lean forward a little bit towards me. Three, two, one. Off we go, more walking. You want to do it? We are walking back because I'm getting a bit cold and I... Are you a bit cold? Oh, look, look at this little archway of, of bushes. Oh, wow. You point the camera at it so the camera can see. This is an archway of bushes. I would like to get a photo of Cora in that archway. Yeah? yeah? All right. So there we go. Uh, pretty chuffed with that, actually. I was quite uh, taken with some of those photos. Exposure is a bit of a struggle, um, but I do have a confession to make on that one. So I bought this camera super cheap because the lens was apparently broken. Got it home, took a look at the lens, and lo and behold, as is so common with these cameras, uh, some genius had been in and oiled the aperture blades. Now, little tip, if your aperture blades on your older camera are starting to slow down a little bit or they're not quite moving as smoothly as they should, what they need is to be cleaned, not to be oiled. Uh, if you oil them, if you put oil on aperture blades or shutter blades, they are such fine mechanisms that the surface tension of the oil will stop them working altogether. And that's exactly what happened with this one. 
uh, somebody had gone in and, and oiled the aperture blades uh, and all of a sudden uh, they were just stuck in the open position with the kind of suction that the oil was creating that stopped the blades moving altogether. Um, so I was in a bit of a hurry and this is the, the camera repairers out there are going to scream at me for this but I was in a bit of a hurry so what I did is I just cleaned it up. I didn't actually give it a proper service. I didn't take it apart fully and clean everything and, and, and do what I should have done. Um, it was working fine. The blades were moving all right. But then at some point between starting that shoot and getting back here, the blades were starting to slow down again. Uh, so some of the shots in, that I took out there are a little bit overexposed. And I think that's probably the reason rather than the exposure meter. Um, and that's my own fault. I'll make that confession and I'll say, you know, my bad. I um, cut a corner and it came back to bite me. So what I will now do is take this lens apart properly and service it properly. However, apart from that, the camera performed really well. It's actually good fun to use. It's a little bit heavy, um, bearing in mind that you are only getting six, four, five frames out of it. Um, but great lenses, as always, Mamiya lenses are terrific, aren't they? Um, and bearing in mind the age of it, it's 1975, what we now, so that's 50 years old, roughly. Um, it's in great nick. You know, that exposure meter is working really well. As I said before, if you are coming from 35mm looking for a toe in the water, a first step in medium format, then a 645 is, is a great idea because it gives you that rectangular frame shape. And if 645 is what you're after, then the Mamiya 645 is uh, definitely one to try. And the 645J, despite being the budget option, I thought this is a cracking camera. Really easy to use, solid, really well built. Uh, so there we go, that's that. Uh, that is all for today. If you're not currently subscribed, please do subscribe. Next up on the channel, I am shooting owls on large format. And I'm not gonna tell you any more than that. See you then, bye.